Can you see me? Can everyone see me right now? Okay, perfect. Um, my name is Darnell Jamal. I'm an education associate here at Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum. Um, and I'd like to thank everyone so much for joining us today for art fashion uh, performance, seeing through collaboration. This program is being held in conjunction with the exhibition, Willie Smith Street Culture, which we hope that you will be able to see extremely soon here at Cooper Hewitt. We wanna give an enormous thanks to Target, Gucci, the Colby Foundation and Keith Herring for making this program possible. With that said, in a similar vein as Willie Smith's career, as we explored in the exhibition and extension resources like the exhibition book and online Willie Smith Community Archive, the conversation today will look at the potential for multidisciplinary collaboration to shift values uh, the shape of Im improvisational careers and the nuances of creative processes and presentation across media. For the speakers today, we have our moderator, Dario Calmis, an artist, writer, director, and brand consultant who made history last year as the first Black photographer to shoot a cover for Vanity Fair in his 106 year history with his portrait of Oscar winning actress Viola Davis. His widely acclaimed podcast, The Institute of Black Imagination, uh, features conversations from the pool of black genius through the lens of design. And he is also, he also contributed greatly to the Willie Smith Street Culture Project with his To Be an American uh, article, which you can find in the book and on the online Willie Smith archive. For our panelists, we have the legendary activist model and muse, Bethann Hardison, who whose five decade career has taken her from working in New York City's garment district to becoming one of the first black models favored by European and New York designers to creative director and producer to founding her namesake agency where she guided the careers of some of the most prominent models in recent times. And one of, as one of Willie Smith's most trusted confidants, she helped him create and inspire his successful design and lifestyle formula, as well as many of his peers, and has an incredible recollection of Smith's life, which we also point you toward the Willie Smith book and online archive for you to read. Uh, lastly, but certainly not the least, uh, we have uh, the always astounding and creative genius Jacoby Satterwhite, whose conceptual practice addresses, it, addresses crucial themes of labor, consumption, uh, carnality and fantasy through immersive installation, virtual reality and digital media, illustration, performance, painting, sculpture, photography and writing. He uses a range of software to produce intricately detailed animations and live action film of real and imagined worlds populated by avatars and artists and friends. Now we encourage you to use the chat box to engage with each other during the live pan during the panel. At the end of the hour, we will open it for questions, which you may submit through the Q&A box and we will get to as many as possible. Please also note uh, that closed captioning is available for this program through the icon at the bottom of your screen. We will also be recording the conversation and you can find it later on Cooper Hewitt's YouTube channel. Uh, though the museum is currently closed to the public, we're, we're thrilled to be able to welcome you to virtually uh, see this program. Uh, and we, we encourage you to explore the exhibition and community archive online, and we'll drop that in a link in the chat. Um, and now I'm excited to now turn it over to Dario. Oh, amazing. All right, awesome. Well, here we go. Um, well, first of all, Darnell, um, thank you so much. Uh, for inviting me to come speak with these two lovely individuals, Miss Beth Ann Hardison and Mr. Jacoby Satterwhite. Um, also thanks to uh, Alexandra and her absence um, and just to the Cooper Hewitt uh, in general, this is an amazing opportunity. And also thank you for not doing this during Black History Month. So anyway. <laughs> So that, so today, like, um, how did we get here? Like, why am I here? Why is Beth Ann here? Like, why is Jacoby here? Uh, you know, a former model and current model, um, an activist and muse, and, you know, Jacoby and, and an artist and, 
you know, uh, virtual reality um, in installationist, and then myself, you know, a photographer and generally curious person. Well, on one hand, this is the kind of motley crew that Willie Smith would have just thrown together. And on the other hand, we can speak about the ways in which fashion, and I mean fashion with a lowercase f, not with a capital F, uh, the ways in which we all have engaged with fashion and or the fashion object in our work and across our various industries. And at its core, it's an engagement that is about space, um, uh, the space between the body and the cloth, uh, the space between the cloth and the gaze, or essentially the distance between you know, who we are and who we present ourselves to be. And it's a way in which like design and materiality are these technological levers um, of conversion. And in many ways, conversion or conversation um, is what today is all about, right? It's about collaboration. It's about mutual, interested, seemingly disparate forces coming together to make something different. Um, it's a creative process to combine and birth a new thing, um, sometimes a third space. It's how coal in conversation with heat and pressure and time can become a diamond. Um, so today, how we'll just kind of organize this is we'll speak to Beth Ann uh, about her, her practice, her life, um, and her relationship to Willie Smith. Um, we'll also speak to Jacoby about his practice and the ways in which he uses collaboration, not only with Beth Ann, but particularly with his own mother um, in his artistic practice. And then we'll actually speak about their combined collaboration and how that came about. Um, and as Darnell mentioned earlier, um, we will open it up for questions um, at the top of the hour. There is a Q&A box, I think if you like, click up top or to the side or however you kind of have it arranged. Um, you can just type questions as we're going along um, and Darnell will uh, cycle back and we'll get to as many as possible. And then also, um, and I'll try to mention it at the end, um, there's a survey. So if you can stick around for a little survey, that'd be amazing. <clears throat> so hop right in. Beth Ann, hi, how are you doing today? Well, I'm a little under the weather, but I'm happy to be here with you. Amen. Yeah, I believe you you got your uh, round two vaccine. Vaccine. And, yeah. and, and, and as they say, it comes with a little, <clears throat> a little some extra. Um, so we're, we're keeping you lifted up. Um, so, you. you know, you've had an, an amazing, you are, you are living and are having an amazing life and an amazing career. You've dipped into many facets of the fashion industry from you know, modeling to Garmento, to model agent, to activist, then back to modeling and then to acting. Um, you know, outside of your own desire and curiosity, you know, a large part of this has been about relationships um, and about creative collaboration with many different individuals. Like what keeps you saying yes to life and what does collaboration allow for? That's a very good question. And it really is something that I speak to myself about often. Often I say, wow, you're still going. You know what I mean? <laughs> because it is something that, you know, most people at a certain time in life, they quit. But there's always some more opportunities for me. And, uh, and I'm very happy to, to be able to sort of like stand up and get it going, you know, and be there. So for me, it's really, um, I'm very, you're so right about collaboration because my relationship with Willie was that. It was a collaboration. Even though I was his muse and sometimes I was his assistant and many different things. Or many people that you, you know, you come along, even when I had a model agency, that was a collaboration. You know, you know, trying to get that particular image to someone, uh, Stephen Mysell, and that that's a collaboration, you know. Everything that you sort of do these days is that. If you are looking to have a certain compassion and you're looking to really help change what we see, but we are able to keep going and keep doing things. So I'm very happy that I have had this opportunity to, to, to have the strength and the um, desire to keep on doing things. And I really do care very much about others. 
So I think compassion is one of the most important things too that can help you even think about being a collaborative person. That for sure. And 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 you like Willie encountered you on the street, right? Like he just kind of kept seeing you come and go and like yeah. send some note. Like how how did you all come into each other's That's sphere? Too, because he, you know, he would see me and uh, unbeknownst to me, I didn't know, but he would see me and he just thought I was a designer, you know, the way I dressed, the way I was. And I, and I said to you, you know, many times people used to say to me, hi, Willie to me and you know just speaking to me like I was Willie Smith and I just at, at some point you know you, you, you get tired of saying no I'm not Willie. it's too many words it's just easy to say yeah hi and keep going right so I think Willie basically saw someone that inspired him and then he had someone he couldn't find out who I was and then the there's a girl that they used to be runners for federated stores that goes drop off orders and, and he asked her and she said you know I think I know who it is and he wrote a note and asked if you could give it to me and, and asked me to meet him downstairs in 1407, which is the, the, the club down restaurant bar in the 1407 building on, on, uh, on Broadway. So of course, that was our beginning. And he asked me then, you know, would I consider working with him in a capacity, just once he learned, learned I wasn't a designer, once he learned I was a showroom girl and I worked in the showroom, you know, he wondered if I could, you know, maybe do things with them. It wouldn't interfere with my work. Sometimes some of the things you have to do is go to Philadelphia, you know, do things for magazines and newspapers. Sometimes it's just appearances. And so I went up and talked to my bosses about it. And they always like, they were always supportive of anything that came my way. Oh, you have to do it. You have to do it. Willie, oh, he's so great. Yeah. So that was a, that was, that, that's another collaboration, you know, when the, you, know, you, you grow up and you're being educated by those others and they really want you to win. And they just, you know, they educate you and they give you opportunities. They don't say, what do you mean? You're going to go, you can't, you can't go. You have to work. No, they were always supportive. It's interesting. And what was this, like, what was this style? Like that not only Willie saw in you, but that you both were kind of moving through the streets with, right? Like, like, and, and, and how are we seeing that like reverberate on the streets today? Because Willie was doing something very special, right? Like he well, was he really was using the street as inspiration. Well, he, he basically was really, literally, he truly was um, making sportswear. And in our case, you know, you've got a good pair of, you know, you got a good pair of pants, you got a great shirt, you got a great jacket, you got a great coat, you know, you, you know, it, it's a style. And you don't know that someone recognizes you having style, you know, you just, you don't think of it. But he did, and uh, it was something about me that he really liked. And you know, I, I was involved with Willie, in, you know, through even his fashion shows, everything. Then when I had a model agency, he supported me. He supported Kim and and, and David for Paper Magazine. It, you know, Willie was someone who really believed in the art. He really was someone who really believed in others. That's that thing again, compassion. And you know, that's the thing that's very interesting to me because he always gave others opportunities. Mm. And because of his character, I think that's why so many people lean towards him. The yeah, I, the yeah I love you mentioned this idea of, 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 of the art. Darnell, could you pull up um, the images of uh, his collaboration with Christo? Uh, and so this is artist, uh, Christo actually recently passed, um, but Beth Ann, like what was Willie doing that was so different? Like he was he was collaborating with, uh, you know, Keith Haring. He was collaborating with Bill T. Jones, um, and it's something that we kind of understand is quite ubiquitous now. But this was quite revolutionary at the time, right? Yeah, you know, it's just so, I'm so glad you say it that way because you know, for us, we're not thinking it's revolutionary because it's just stuff that's happening. You know, things happen, so you look at it in respect. It's like when Versailles happened. You know. We didn't think it was that important, but later in life you'd realize it and you reflect back. It was just his character. It was who he was. And I think people like uh, Christo and, and Jean-Marie, I think they just really, uh, you know, liked him. And so they gave him opportunity to do things. So the workers, he, he did the worker shirts, you know, people who really helped him to, to organize. So he did that, whatever little things that people could involve in him because they liked him so much. And you know, you're right. It doesn't happen like that now. 
You know, now it's either licensing, you know, <laughs> it's not quite the same. But this was real pure artistry, one artist appreciating the other. And I really, really, I really appreciated all of that, everything that would happen to him. It was all, I mean, he did furniture, no furniture. I mean, a lot of them did at that time because it was a big, uh, you know, but he did, he did so many things. Amazing, Darnell, we can, I think we can, um, we can take that down. Thank you so much. Um, and, and Jacoby, hi, how are you? Um, hello. <laughs> I'm doing well, I'm doing well. Um, so on this vein of collaboration, um, we're going to pull up um, a, a piece called uh, Matriarch, the, what is Matriarch's it? Rhapsody. The Matriarch's Rhapsody. We're gonna pull it up in a second. Um, but in your practice, like how do you view collaboration and your mother is, has always kind of been your collaborator as well. How has that played out? And how does that influence the way in which you, you think and work? Um, I, think, um, <clears throat> I think that like the mode of collaboration really found its conceptual grounding for me um, in my early twenties when I was taking a break from painting and moving towards the performance practice and thinking about surrealism and Dada and the methods they use to kind of um, achieve modes of creation, uh, which is like they would play games like exquisite courts or games of chance by reading um, performance instructions um, as a way to resist against like the Western canon and co you know colonized you know minds that that painting has created and because I was feeling like as a black artist, I was um, just sort of trapped in creating apologetically for a white audience. And so performance felt like it gave me agency. But when I went back home to South Carolina um, that, that year, I remember, you know, oh my God, goodness, like my practice actually started with my mother. Like when I was a child, my mother would make thousands and thousands of schematic diagrams. Um, after her diagnosis of schizophrenia, she basically had this um, feverish, um, she had this feverish desire to be an entrepreneur and would create schematic diagrams of common objects, of ordinary objects in the house that were supposed to be inventions that were patent. They were like Da Vincian drawings. Um, and she would send them off to the Home Shopping Network and to other programs and patents or places, whatever, or publishing places. I mean, very like in a delusion of grandier way, but I believed in it and that's what made me become an artist. And so it was, I would kind of create with her um, when I was a kid, as she, I had to learn how to draw in order to help or whatever. But, you know, as the drawings accumulated over the decades and I was an older artist and realizing, oh my God, my mother just wrote me like, you know, a lifetime of performance scores, I decided, wow, these should be kind of like um, instructions for the way that I approach making things. And so through a lot of trial and error experiments, I realized I could trace and create these drawings in 3D animation software and composite them into those spaces to create painterly landscapes for my body to perform in. A lot of my work, you know, stems from me using a green screen and a camera and going on that green screen with costumes I would used to make and I would perform. And then I would composite my body thousands, I mean, hundreds of times in the space to make this sort of pastoral concert scene that was like a Titian painting. And eventually I realized, and then that's what opened the floodgates of collaboration because my practice became this thing about collecting archives, whether it was archives of other performances, performers I would solicit to perform on my green screen or archives of found images off the internet that I found were really politically charged and if they were put into a constellation together could create a really powerful statement. But it was about, my practice is actually sort of like weaving incongruent matter together to find form. Because when you're trying to force things together that really don't belong, it kind of creates this tension. And the tension reveals my subconscious, um, it reveals my subconscious um, intent. Um, I mean, and that's why 
you know, like a lot of my work, I'm, I, I'm, I have a blind, I walk, I enter my work really blindly. I, I, I kind of like, I operate from the id and then I go into the ego, which is like, this is how I got to, you know, that end, you know, because I was, I mean, if we should, should I proceed to talk about that? Or yeah, go, go. I mean, you know, I, well, you know, you're, you're sorry. You were just like wearing me out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> because I'm like, there's so many things that you're bringing up that I just want to like talk about uh, before we go into the collaboration with Beth Ann. Like, um, and it's slightly tangential, but you know, in, in, in growing up with um, a, a schizophrenic mother um, and, you know, this kind of vocabulary that it, not only um, artistically gives you access to, but also mentally gives you access to. I mean, you're just, you know, casually throwing out terms like, you know, id, ego, super ego. Um, how, how does, how do you think of mental illness, um, particularly as it pertains to um, black peoples in our community and how and if, and does it relate to virtual reality which is a space in which you inhabit i think there's well some... yeah it's true <laughs> i'm like putting you in the yeah because actually mental illness is, especially schizophrenia is about hallucinations and you are um embodying a world that really doesn't exist but you kind of really believe it and it's happens for the rest of your life so it's in a way a kind of you know like I'll, i use the reification a lot in my work the, the term like reifying desires the series i made and um it's about like you know f making a concrete form for something that can never be concretized like love is something that you cannot put into form but you know in my work i try to figure out how to you know use abstraction to deliver the essence of it and so in a way like that's why i'm saying um, bringing incongruent ideas together to build form is sort of like a gesture that metaphorically aligns with what what the, the idea of mental illness. I mean, you know, mental illness is always swept under the rug in the Black community, but I thought, I think of it as, you know, you're tapping to another dimension, but there's a catch-22 is that you're not completely inside of the dimension that we're all collectively in, and therefore there's a tension and a conflict that leads to pain suffering but um yeah I, I actually never really thought about and I, I never aligned the vr thing with mental illness but now that you mention it, it's like yeah that is very true <laughs> hey there's a there it's like that's something i have to marinate on in regards to fear. yeah but yeah i mean yeah no i mean as you as you speak i mean when you speak about you know taking um, incongruency um, and, you know, just making it into forms. I mean, there's really no difference between that and what we're doing, right, on a daily basis. It's just a matter of the majority of us have decided that these incongruous, you know, vibrations create these forms, you know, and this is, you know, something that exists outside of it, but the ways in which, you know, virtual reality allows, you know, those of us who are quote unquote normal to access perhaps um, spaces that uh, we have not been conditioned to understand, right? That we can be outside of the ideas of, of gravity and space and time. Um, but let me, let me not go too, too, <laughs> too off track here. Um, so, so Beth Ann, you know, before we even speak about this collaboration with Jacoby, um, you've been amused for a very long time, mm. like for many, many people, like what does it mean to be a muse and what does it feel like to be a muse? Yeah, very good question. And you know what, I wish it was still more of a, a circumstance now. There's not so much of that now, especially in our industry when it comes down to the fashion model servicing the fashion industry the designer. It, it, it's sort of like gone away, maybe because there's so many models and, and that we have now casting directors. We don't have that relationship between the designer and the model. And that's where it all becomes a relationship of collaboration because she's inspired by it. There's no one in between. It's like someone gets in the bed between the, the model and the designer. The point of it really is, is that that is something that has, has gotten lost. 
So for me, I mean, I am, I, I really was that person, uh, you know, with for Willie, for Stephen Burroughs, but also then now coming back even for Alessandro Michele, you know, that cracked me up because I really didn't want to even imagine that. I mean, it, it was like, oh, I'm done with that, you know? But then you, you begin to understand that there's, someone is creating something and you must open your mind an opportunity to, to participate in it, not, not to shy away from it or because it's a, it's a, once again, collaboration, but also it's an art form of, of doing something, making something happen. It, it wouldn't happen without you. It wouldn't happen without you. And that's the whole thing that you recognize as we, as we go on. I, I mean, I'm still impressed with Jacoby and him, him looking at me when we're doing that shoot and then hit becoming so much more part of his continuance of his next you know, uh, show and that he just, it just worked for him. And, you know, once again, you're a muse. You're an inspiration to something that someone else is creating. So I, I to, for me, I'm, 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 I'm very happy to be an inspiration to anyone. You know, um, you, that's what I've been doing all my adult, adult life. I think, you know, coming from the sixties all the way through, you, you got lucky to have that opportunity and to have people really see you and what they do when they see you, they give you an opportunity that you didn't even know. They help educate you. If you talk about self-esteem, it becomes a whole new ball game. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm inspired just, look <laughs> just looking at you and I'm like, you know what, you're right, but then I need a muse. I need, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to see if they have a section on Craigslist um, for muses or something. Or maybe, or maybe there's like an Airbnb, like version of like muse. I don't know. Like we could like rent a muse. Um, something. There's got to be a way. Jacoby. We need, we need to bring him back. Make sure that don't let's give it. Get it. The great thing with, with Jacoby, he could actually create that in his, in his world because he is an artist that has no relationship to another industry. That is the industry that I'm mostly known for, which is the fashion industry, the model industry. So he has an opportunity to do that because that's where his inspiration lies and that's where he goes full on. So that's wonderful in that way. And that's actually a good segue. So how did this collaboration come about? Uh, I, I'm gonna throw that to Jacoby. Okay. Um, well. Do you remember? I do remember. <laughs> <laughs> It was actually super serendipitous in a wonderful way. Um, I was approached by Interview Magazine um, to drive upstate to Bethan's house and spend a wonderful afternoon having a wonderful conversation <laughs> about her like life. She was telling me so many wonderful stories, but she, I was supposed to shoot an editorial uh, for a profile she was doing in the icons issue for interview magazine and Zendaya did the interview and it was just a wonderful thing. I was really excited to do it. Sorry, but sorry I to interrupt you. Darnell, can we can we pull that image up? Yeah, that's true. Um, and you want to know something as you're pulling the image up, you know what's so interesting too? That I learned from him that he went to school right down the road from my house. Oh wow. I mean they, in in Woodstock. Oh yeah, I did a residency there for yeah. an entire summer. The, I, the, the, yeah, the, the ICP uh, in Woodstock, it, yeah. which yeah. was like, I spent like, you know, months in the Catskill Mountains doing film in the waterfalls and creeks that end up like being in my body of work. So I, I kind of like have made really important work in the woods of upstate. Yeah. <laughs> okay, um, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I totally interrupted you, Jacoby, Con continue. Oh, so uh, yeah, I, um, as you see in the photograph, I spent Ann's house and um, I, the, way the, the way that it became more integrated into this much larger piece at my solo exhibition is that like 2020 was really hard for everyone and paralyzed a lot of people creatively, including myself. I mean, my chest had lot palpitations trying to maintain a creative career when certainty was destabilized entirely. And I feel like, you know, in a way it was like, I was working from a place of faith that, you know, 
we would be able to have continue culture and having a discourse in the art world. I wasn't sure if my work would even see a public opening at a gallery, you know, or anything. Mm-hmm. I, I was like, and then 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 George Floyd happened and Brianna Taylor and like uh, there were protests of people marching downstairs from my apartment. And it was just like this paralyzing lack of focus that I had. And usually my work kind of operates where I like to like play in the world of abstraction and illegibility and allowing the viewer to meet me halfway to find some sort of conceptual thing. But this was the first time I wanted to be more direct because I could only be direct in 2020. It was like such a, a urgent year, you know? And I was working, um, I'm writing many different storyboards and I was thinking about how like 2020 seems like the new modernism, like, you know, in 18, I forgot, like in the 19th century or when, um, you know, Manet created Luncheon in the Grass, that pastoral concert scene, it was the considered the painting that was, the, it was a painting that was considered the dawn of modernism, the, what, which led to Picasso because it was him painting for ordinary people in the woods um, on a canvas, you know, like the canvas was reserved for royalty and regal people. Mm. And so it was like, this is like the pursuit of truth. So I thought like, well, 2020 seems like a paradigm shift culturally, like we, there's a new normal. And so I wanted to focus on the idea of the pastoral concert scene. And when I went up to Beth Ann's house, it looked like that setting. And when I was shooting her and thinking, about, and I was also thinking about how like the black woman in 2020 seemed like the most vulnerable uh, kind of entity that, you know, not only like black people in communities like the Bronx and Queens are, 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 are like sub, like more vulnerable to the coronavirus and also to police brutality. It's like, there, it seems like the most negated figure. And so my piece that I was creating, I wanted to create this alternative universe where the black female had the most agency and the most power and like was the central figure. And listening to Beth Ann talk about her life and her work and her journey, I was like, oh my God, she's the ultimate muse and matriarch figure for my mm-hmm. So she's been an agent of change and um, bringing representation to the black female, like, you know, down to every, like, you Campbell, everybody, like, she's really like allowed young, like, through her energy and her mission, like, you know, she's like a sort of conduit to a lot of young black girls around the world to see images of themselves to inspire them to grow up and make change. So, like, if the domino effect of her existence ultimately just made sense for her to be the the, the main force in this video. So I was like, oh my God, I have all this great footage. And I composited her throughout the scene. And then like, you see the whole concept of the pieces. I have these cyborg ultra, like powerful female figures that are like destroying biological threats. It's very abstract. They're like, it's like kind of heroic. And then at the end of the video, um, it ends with this floral shrine dedicated to Breonna Taylor. Um, But Beth Ann is seen throughout the entire video as sort of like, you know, and she's she's in the composition of Manet's painting, The Luncheon in the Grass, in this pastoral scene. And so it's like a virtual reality version of that painting. And instead of me giving um, a nod to ordinary people, I'm giving an odd, a nod to divine black females. Like, mm. You know, Manet said, I'm painting ordinary people, I'm painting divine females, and this is my alternative universe because we are entering the new normal. So, you know, I don't know, whatever. <laughs> So that no, that's up. wonderful, Beth Ann. How does it feel to be the divine, the divine? I'm, 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 I'm getting ready to, to levitate. I mean, <laughs> I, I'm trying to hold on to the to the bench, but you know, <laughs> because, because you know, God, you know, it's so it's so wonderful because you don't know this. You know, I didn't even know that. After the, you know, which is, you, you know, you got to give a real shout out to Interview Magazine because of the things that they're doing in general and the the, the, the idea that they can say, oh, no, we'll, who, what do you think? And, you know, really, in my list, they gave me a list of who you want to interview. And, you know, it, it's a day. But I don't think they're going to get to there because they had somebody who we're going to connect it because of my son and we thought like family. But she was like, yes. He was the first one that they wanted. And then he being that person too. It was just such an interesting thing to have it all happen. And who knew that I would wind up in his, you know, single most important show. 
You know, that Amazing. was amazing. And I couldn't go because I was so frightened. Of, I didn't want to, I didn't want to, you know, give Corona a run for the money. So I sent my, my neighbor and she rode on her bike and went down to the, to the, uh, to the gallery and she just filmed it all because I had Brazilian friends of mine who work in art. They were like saying, this is you, this is your house. Or, you know, and it was very nice to, to have that because I had no idea that he had taken it to the next level. So it's wonderful. It's wonderful. Thank you. So yeah, thank, you so, for, because, thank you for yeah. being there and allowing it happen because it was the, you know, I was so frustrated working in the studio and I was like, there's something missing. And <laughs> it just and then, worked and then, out. Along came back there. Yeah, it's great, it's great. Um, so I, I wanna quickly allow um, our viewers to get a small snippet of this collaboration. Um, Darnell, if you could pull it up for us. Um, so this is just about two minutes worth, um, but just to give you all a really great sense of what we've been talking about <laughs> for the last 10 minutes um, and I'll, I'll be quiet. In hell, when we fail to exist, we are in hell when we never has a risk. We are in hell when we break others. watching it on your phone or your computer screen, um, you know, try to imagine actually being immersed in this world. So this is actually a VR experience. And um, it was at Mitchell Innocent Nash in Chelsea uh, here in New York City. And, you know, you have, you know, your Oculus Rift on and you are actually like in this world and you're looking around. So like Jacoby, well, first of all, congratulations again, but like, yeah. You know, but like, tell us a little bit, like how this, like how you physically created this, like the voice we hear is, is your mother, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, the voice, it started with this, yeah, it start, well, my mother created 155 or more acapellas in the mental hospital and at home, along with the drawing. She all, it was all about like publishing. She was like, I'm, I gotta be a star <laughs> and I want to make commercial jingles and I want to make R&D songs and I'm just the next Shaka Khan or whatever. Um, and, uh, you know, 20 years later, I realized that 
they were compelling lyrics, very nice poems. Um, and the vocals were very cool. I like the cracky vocals on a cassette tape. It was really raw. And so after the Whitney Biennial, I was taking a break and I had a studio visit with the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art. And they offered me this two year commission to create whatever I wanted for this like performance residency there. And I decided over lots of glasses of wine, I was like, oh, I want to make a concept album. I want to make a virtual reality album that's an hour and 24 minutes. And um, just to bring back objecthood to this listening experience because everything is on streaming services. And, you know, like I thought like, okay, see these vinyl records and A-tracks are gone. How, how else can we have a, you know, a sculptural, a, you know, approach to the sonic medium? And, and I thought like, oh, I should make, I think that making a, a concept album with like making 14 tracks from my mother's acapella collection, but you know, with instrumentation from electronic music and jungle drum and bass and trip hop and all the uh, genres that influenced me with, and I, it was one of my favorite, you know, electronic musicians, Nick Weiss uh, from Teen Girl Fantasy. We became like best friends over two years um, working in the studio together. I learned so much about you know, Ableton Live and synthesizers, and it, it, it's a painterly medium on its own. And what was interesting about making it is that, like, this is a, you know, it became a much more dynamic collaboration because it was a collaboration with my mother, me, and the people who I was casting in the films. It just became this, like, metastasis of collaboration. But what was interesting about it is, um, sorry, I'm losing train of thought. What was interesting about it is that the music was influencing how I would go back to the studio to create film. And the film was ex influencing how I was thinking about the sonic experience and the atmosphere and like, you know, the textures of sound and what I needed for the video and what the video needed for the sound. And it became a synesthesia approach to making. Um, and so, yeah, in a way I'm, you know, like the lyrics, I'm not meant to be didactic or like, you know, storytelling. I, the lyrics kind of guide motifs that I put into the film in a very distant way. But yeah, that's kind of like my approach that answers that question, I guess. Yeah, no, I mean, I'm, I think the lyrics are just so good. First of all, <laughs> thank you for even captioning it in the video. I think they're so prescient and, um, you know, kind of circling back to our previous conversation around um, mental illness or understanding um, how we uh, approach it from a place of quote unquote normalcy. You know, I think your combination of those lyrics in this space that you created, and mind you, like Jacoby, like physically, like rendered all of these um, objects, like this takes like months and sometimes years to create these films. Um, they ring, they ring true they ring true in a different way, in a way in which, you know, just kind of linear speech and English syntax um, doesn't quite allow for that. I think a, coming from a different perspective can shine light on truths that we perhaps don't have access to, but that's another conversation. Um, so before we open it up to questions, um, I wanted to briefly talk about um, what's kind of happening um, in contemporary art and culture, particularly NFTs. Um, and for those of you all listening who do not know what an NFT is, it is not uh, nifty. It means um, non-fungible tokens. Um, and so non-fungible tokens are, um, they could, it could be artwork, it could be video clips, but essentially it's intellectual property um, that can exist in a digital space. So there are um, decentralized spaces on the blockchain and blockchain just meaning decentralized, you know, servers that, that information is shared over a large global network. Um, um, but, you know, I think Christie's just auctioned its first digital art piece um, by Beeple's for $7 million. And so essentially what a non-fungible to token is, is a proof of ownership. It means that I own this thing. So the Mona Lisa, could it's potentially 69 have... million wait what 69 million 69 yes <laughs> it was like I, like literally when i looked it was like 7 million 69 million okay so this is crazy so outside of like the financial bubble that we're heading towards um you know you working in 
virtual reality and digital art, I mean, I think it seems to me that you're quite primed to step into this space. Like, are you thinking about um, NFTs and how it relates to your work? Yeah, I'm doing a little experiment. <laughs> Maybe next week. We'll take it, take it, take it up the octave for me. Uh huh. Yeah, I'm doing a little experiment. <laughs> We're working. I'm working with a, some people. Um, I did. I have like a lot of interesting experiments that I never released in the art world, I guess. And I'm just testing some things out next week and we'll see what happens. But I think it's really cool. I think I just conceptually, I just am interested in it because it's interesting how like, I mean, I'm interested into cryptocurrency and, and how like the blockchain, like I'm interested in um, this weird way to concretize digital media and the idea of like a token being represented by something that is laborious. Cause like, you know, I always felt like I'm a painter at heart and I, I feel like I, I still make paintings and I'm very committed to like real art. And the thing about it is that when I work in Maya and I work in After Effects, the processes that are involved in creating a digital work that I make is more this viscous and more, more visceral, more labor intensive, more mark making, more erasure, more addition, me green screening my body performing, there's so much like physicality involved in producing these works that they are raw, real, full objects. And so I find it amazing that like, I can put something on the internet on a non-fungible token and like 25 people can purchase it in shares and, and build a value and then like I own it's, it like it allows my work to continuously live and become more valuable. That's something really interesting about it I, don't, I so knew I don't know what to say but I'm interested I kind of like you know why not <laughs> um I think it's, I was like, oh, I was wondering when it would this happen anyway, because the art world always does this the Duchamp thing. Like every decade, there's some form that wasn't considered valuable that takes over. And like the way performance art did, like it's always, or something, you know, it's always, I was like, when is, how is digital art really going to have this like weird monetization moment that's like insane and it's like oh god but it's happening in this way that's weird because a lot of the uh, nft people aren't in the art world they're like people popular in niche tumblr circuits or in or on instagram or grimes or celebrity or zelia banks and writers you know um i don't know we'll see where it goes uh but i'm trying something out well, we look forward to finding out what that is. Uh, hopefully we'll hear about it soon. But yeah, I think it is super interesting, um, you know, as the art world, um, you know, kind of circles around this idea. And it definitely is like a Duchampian um, urinal moment, right? We are at, you know, a critical pivot point in just reimagining what art is. And I think, you know, digital art has been made for so long and I think I think culture hadn't quite caught up to um, the ways in which it can be valuable and the ways in which it can be displayed and I think it's been challenging um, particularly in a, in space and time in actual space and time um, to to speak to like how these things are valuable so I'm super excited to see what you come up with um, and also, thinking about you and other artists creating in this medium, you know, the fusion of art and technology, right? Like you are at the vanguard of this next phase. And it's something that artists from time immemorial have always been um, enmeshed in. You know, when you think about Leonardo da Vinci, he was always playing with technology. He was always playing with different kinds of um, pigments and um, techniques and, you know, ways to, you know, build sculptures out of one cast bronze uh, piece where before it was, you know, um, horses were cast in like individual pieces. So I think it's wonderful to see how you are really stepping into a very old tradition, actually, um, this real fusion of art and technology. But like I said, I'm going to stop talking and we're going to open it up for questions. Bethann, did you have anything you want to add about NFTs? Oh, I, you Are know, you going to be an NFT? 
But Best if, hand should do it in FT. <laughs> if you two say so, I'll be whatever it can be. I don't want to stop. <laughs> it sounds like this is a modern moment. I just want to keep up. Yes. No, for sure. No, for sure. It's interesting. Thank you so much for even continually educating us because you really do have so much information. And look at look at you. I mean, you actually know about Leonardo da Vinci because you read the book, right? Walter Isaacson. Yeah. See, I mean, who does that? You. <laughs> no, it's, 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 you know, but, you know, thank, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, um, no so let's. So let's see, um, I'm going to check in the questions. Um, we have a question from uh, Carmela. Uh, let's see, starting the art community, what do you want to be successful in that area? How do you plan to take on your career? Okay, um, so from Carmela, when you started in the art community, were you worried of being successful in your area? I'm thinking that's probably going to go to Jacoby. Oh, well, who isn't? <laughs> I mean, you know, you go to art school and spend a hundred thousand dollars on education, you think something's going to go down. But like for me, it, initially, it was about I wanted to be an art teacher at first, and um, I came from like this really hood-looking area in Columbia, South Carolina, and I had like low drink like my like expectations of what would happen in my life was very like humble in the beginning and then you know I went to a boarding school in the latter part of my edu high school education and I started to see more other possibilities but it was until you know my sophomore year in college I created a suite of paintings that one of my professors kind of for the first time said you you could really take off one day like he's like have you thought of going to Yale and I was like Yale for MFA and I was just like you know that was kind of like I, I had a few people in my life plant seeds of like, you know, shoot for the stars sort of. And that brought in my hunger to like be more disciplined. And, you know, like, I think that was just things, you know, I don't know. I, I, I just did everything I could to make sure I was at the height of my abilities. And I always, you know, I wanted to go to the grad school. I wanted to do Skowhegan and I did 12 residencies after grad school because at some point art became the only thing I knew how to do because it was what I did 24 seven. I, le I left no room for anything else. And so after, you know, going through 12 residencies and building this massive network through many different kinds of artists and writers and curators, I just naturally became ingrained in it. And there was a lot of suffering and a lot of hard work and a lot of sleeping on floors in one degree weather. And like, I don't know, it was just like at LMCC after Hurricane Sandy, like it was just so, the journey has been very intense. And so, yeah, I was worried. Yeah, I, I, was, I was worried that, uh, I was worried. I, I feel like it became like in a, a compulsory addiction to create 24 hours a day. And I was like, I would do whatever it takes for me to continue the pipeline I've been doing in grad school and within the residences. Because residences, they pay you like $700 a month, which is nothing, but they give you housing and stuff and you can create 24 hours. And so like my whole adulthood is just used to working 24 hours a day on art. I mean, not 24 hours, but you know what I mean? Like the whole 12 hour day of work making art. I don't know about retail even though i did work in retail one time and i hated it right, right, right. working in retail actually made me realize fuck this shit <laughs> this is a family platform jacoby <laughs> oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> i'm sorry it's, it's it's new york so it flies um <laughs> so we have another question um Let's see, from Luann, hi Luann. Can you talk to us about how art can help to transform racist attitudes and help shape an inclusive and equitable future? Well, I feel like Beth Ann could answer the question because she's like, she realized the importance of diversity and like, because mo like the model is it's like um Pygmalion like I don't know like the model is I took a class on the model in at University of Pennsylvania actually um with Wendy Steiner she wrote this book about the model and the history of art and its importance of like transitioning theories and ideas and so I don't know um yeah Bethann you want to hop like, into that 
I'm taking notes. <laughs> I was so busy listening to him that I might have lost some of the question, but I think the fact of it is, is that, what was the question again? Um, let me see. It was essentially, how can art um, be used as a tool to transform racist attitudes? Absolutely. Absolutely. It's the same thing with music. I think it's, it definitely can. Visual, <clears throat> visual opportunities changes everything. And for me to see what can be done in the art world, as an artist or as a photographer, or as uh, someone who basically is pardon me, living that life to change what we see because they get the opportunity to really basically give us an opportunity to see what we don't normally see. So if we see the black image, we don't normally see it sometimes. And so we get an opportunity for someone of color to tell the story of the black image. And that can change a lot of things because it starts changing everybody's mindset the people who hire you, the people who think that that could never happen. It starts to change everything. So it's a very wonderful opportunity in art, really music to me, and also for film, you know, it all, if you get the opportunity, what we have now, we do have an opportunity, and we're taking advantage of it. So this is our moment to really sort of like play in all of that. Yeah, and, and Jacoby, could you speak a bit uh, about what maybe you remember from Wendy Steiner and the model and the ways in which it could relate to this question? Um, well, that's hard. <laughs> well, we, <laughs> I want, I could speak more about like how, I can speak some more like, I don't know. It, uh, I mean, in the art history, it, yeah, the model is like the metaphor. And so if you think about Olympia by Manet and there's the white nude who's laying down and she has her servant who's this black lady, you know, like, I guess, I don't know how to speak about that. I'm sorry. I mean, I actually am like flustered right now because I don't know. Um, I, no, I, I think it's, I think, I think, no, I think it's okay. I think it's about, you know, um, in, in looking at your piece with Beth Ann, what, just what presence means, yeah. what representation means, um, what does reification mean, um, mm -hmm. what does um, um, being uplifted and shown in a place of beauty and prestige mean? You know, for example, I was, um, doing a job for the Met Museum, which will be coming out soon, yay. Um, but I was there when they were closed. I had the museum to myself for like two days. And it was interesting because when you are in a museum and you actually remove people, yes. you're really just left with the artifacts. And then you're really, like, you're really allowed to think about what was decided, like who decided what was worth saving? And who deemed that this is what, this was the story that needed to be told. And how that is reified over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. You're really left with the weight of it, knowing full well that there were so many other things that were created that, that fell away, that left behind. And so it's a way for you know, a, a certain group of people to, to uphold a history um, and to, re, in a way, rewrite history because it is what remains. And so I think what you're doing and what Beth Ann has done, you know, undulating throughout her career is replace some of these images to add to this canon of understanding of what is beauty. You know, I mean, there's so many things that are happening just in that piece that you are coming up against, not only, um, um, gender roles and not only race, but also, you know, ageism, right? Like rewriting the history of, of what does it mean for a mature woman to be beautiful and to also be held in a place of like regalness and regard. And what does that mean? And what does that allow for? But, but anyway, um, let me <laughs> go to these other questions because, you know, my father is a pastor and I will talk for the rest of the day. Um, let's see. This is from Timothy, um, and this is going to Jacoby. 
to Colby, given the relative newness of the technology of virtual reality, your work is considered innovative or perhaps ahead of the times. Do you think virtual reality will become a mainstay in art and maybe one day be seen with the same ordinary, ordinariness as painting and other traditional art forms? Yeah, absolutely. Because we, I mean, it's, well, it's like, it, for, it took decades like people have been trying to make virtual reality happen since the 90s. There were just so many like bad versions of it. But now it's reached, technology and has reached a level where, you know, it's much more nuanced and complex. And, you know, virtual reality can be used for medical purposes. It can be used for people with PTSD. Like there's a, somebody made a, a virtual reality piece so, so his grandmother could visit Cuba again and he made he a 360 camera in her neighborhood in Cuba that she lived in and was born and she was crying and it was like healing. But, you know, also mixed meat, like now they, they create these uh, HoloLens where it's a, it's a glass, it's like, it's like a, um, a glass shield where, you know, it's basically, it can map your environment that you're already in and create experiences in VR. You know, it's constantly evolving. And with Elon Musk making the Neuralink, which is a chip they put in your brain, they drill it in there. And it's actually they're using for people with uh, who are paralyzed to kind of help them move their arm again. But also the Neuralink can help you do talk telepathic things. Like if I have an, a chip in my brain, you have a chip in my brain, we could speak to each other like text messages. Or if I have a Neuralink in my brain, I could like control my computer without using my hands as I'm like the cursor of the mouse. But this is some, this is in the beta stage. So imagine 20 years later what the Neuralink will be. It will probably be something where you can create VR experiences, which is kind of scary. Like it's, we're, you know, now that their technology is really taking off. Um, and VR can be used for training purposes. And um, it's really, it's here to stay forever. Cause this is just the beginning. Like my work will look like a Nintendo game in like a couple of years, but it will be, it, it won't be obsolete because the way I work about with it is very, um, in a process oriented, it's like the same thing when you see like a John Michel Basquiat thing. It's like a certain primitiveness, kind of like not primitive, like a certain kind of like one to one ratio between the person and the object that the, the creator and the object that like it'll sustain itself. But VR is definitely VR has so many places to go, and I I actually have so many desires for it that I, you know, I haven't never I haven't even scratched the surface of what I want to do with it, but. Yeah, it's just like painting. I mean, I go back to, my VR sent me back to painting and then my painting sends me back to VR, you know, like, it's, yeah. Lovely. Yeah, I, I mean, in a way we're kind of living, you know, particularly even just with our phones, right? It almost, we're almost like in like caveman times. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? It's like, we're living in a world of images anyway. So we're mm -hmm. actually living in virtual reality and not quite even realizing it. And even the idea of like black and white, right? Like you've never seen anyone whose skin is actually the color black and you've never seen anyone whose skin is the color white, meaning that they are just symbols that are a stand in for something, which means that we're really just reacting to screens and chimeras and ghosts. So in a way what we're seeing or co-creating is virtual reality anyway. So we're kind of already there. Yeah, um, right. Mm -hmm. what we're, all, we're all cyborgs already we're like our artificial intelligence already um absolutely and, and that's gonna go crazy too um i have another question from regine gilbert um from an education from an education perspective how do we balance the history of fashion and art for those who are new to these fields that's from regine how do we balance it yeah, I'll read it again. From an education perspective, how do we balance the history of fashion and art for those who are new to those fields? Jacoby, they've always <laughs> been. They've always. They've always been. I mean, fashion and art is very exclusive to one another. If you think about, you know, Basquiat and his, you know, Keith Haring, they were very integrated with fashion. Alexander McQueen's use like, or Mark Jacobs like with Elizabeth Payton or, or uh, Sterling Ruby with Raph Simmons, uh, fashion and art have been- Or, or Versailles. Or Versailles, yeah. <laughs> and like Marie Antoinette, like. Mm -hmm. Like they're all mutually exclusive. 
and I don't think they, you know, people used to like do a high low thing between fashion art, but like honestly, most of my main inspirations came from fashion editorials that I would look at, like the Dolce and Gabbana ads from V Magazine in the early 2000s that were inspired by Paul Katniss paintings, like really, really influenced the way that I thought, think about composition and space. And like, also like the, the like, scare, the scary, oh no, sorry, this, this, sorry. The scary uh, whiteness of an Abbott and Crombie and Fitch, Fitch quarterly catalog really put a stain in my brain, you know, when I was a teenager. And I don't know where that went to, but like fashion is, it's all, I think of it as the same. Yeah. I love Nick Knight. Nick Knight is one of my main influencers because he's the first person to bring digital software into fashion photography yeah. um, with like the, the York images and the um, everything, you know? It's interesting you say, you mentioned uh, uh, Keith Haring and, and, and Basquiat. I never think of them as fashion. We were just all a fashionable group of people living downtown, all hanging out. It was a cultural moment, but I never think of them as being part of fashion. But because we all were like, you know, involved in so many things, we all sort of like were, were with each other. But the influences you know, definitely didn't seem like it came from anything like that. But that's interesting too, that you could, because you think about it, it, it seems like that. You think of Basquiat, you think of, because they're so culturally engaged in everything that everyone's doing. That he, he's become like a, you know, he's iconic as, as Keith is. But me knowing them both, I never thought it was anything to do with fashion, you know? But yeah. at the same time, we were all hanging out. So I guess in some kind of way, you know, I never even think of myself in fashion because I, you know, me, I hate the word. Now. But the, the whole idea of style and, you know, and, and that's what we really think of. And look at, you know, um, when you think about Bill T. Jones and Grace and Keith, and they did their thing, you know? You know, the painting on the body and all that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. That was some, that, that's like iconic, that's forever. I mean, even like when I, um, I work with David Cassavant's archive, who's one of my best friends, I like, he has, the uh, biggest collection of Ralph Simmons and Helmut Lang pieces in the world. And he kind of loan, he, oh, sorry, my phone keeps going. He loans his stuff out to Ralph Simmons himself so he can use the museums and like loans his clothes to Rihanna and Drake and all these celebrities to wear. And, and actually, Kanye West uses his archive as a template for Yeezy, like to study. And so, what I use his archive for fashion for, which is like he has miscellaneous pieces by Comte de Garçon, and like, you know. Yoshi Yamamoto and a lot of those pieces are some you know they're historical they come from the 90s and early 2000s and they represent identities that are now faded out some of his clothes represent queer communities that no longer exist and certain black communities that no longer exist and I can be like Cindy Sherman and dress up in these clothes and wear wigs for my performances to, uh, to create the silhouettes of these identities for my films like a lot I'm very inspired by like the 90s gay black male that you was brave enough to be out and proud in the clubs and at the shelter, the Paradise Garage, like the Willie Ninjas, like, and I, he has this archive where I can, you know, be Cindy Sherman and like. Okay, you have so many references. You, you know, you, you're not 70 years old, yet you know so much. I, I'm sitting here saying to myself, God, gee, he really, but that's the, that's the intellect. That's the same thing with Dario. You know, you, 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 you're hungry for information. And that's really wonderful. You know, that's really wonderful. And it's because of who you are, not because you're involved in fashion, but you will, you can lift it and, and, and play with it and let it inspire you. But I tell you, I'm very impressed today. I, I, I sat here and I learned so much. Um, Thank just you. Knowing you, you must be, I, I think, you know, I, I don't know what to say. You're just too much for me. That means a oh. lot to me. I feel so good. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much, Beth Ann. Thank you. I appreciate it. I, I actually have a question for you from Christine King. Um, do you have a sense of how the work you have done will continue to inspire and inform generations to come? And what advice would you give to those who want to champion diversity and representation? I, I think it definitely... It will definitely, I, I do feel, you know, I always say I have my foot on the clutch, making sure that nothing slips back. But I do think that we are always going to see and remember this moment where diversity really had its play and the model of color definitely got their moment. 
back because it was not like brand new. It is back. So that's for sure. And those who might want to champion it, you know, I always I say everybody is not meant to ride the Trojan horse. Some people are meant to pull the Trojan horse. So it's something like, you know, you can't, it's, it's something that really is meant for those who are meant to be a revolutionary. Not everyone is. And you mustn't feel bad about it. What you must do is recognize who is doing it and support it. That's what you must do. Don't, don't try to be like somebody. Don't try to be like me. Don't try and figure, oh, I can do this. She did it. A lot of us are not meant to do that. What we're meant to do is recognize and support. Amazing. Um, I have another question. This is actually from my mother. So this is very meta. Um, to Jacoby, how do you allow your inspiration not to overwhelm your artistry? Wow, that's a really good question. Um, it does. It, oh, it does overwhelm it, actually. Um, it really, it used to, when I was younger, my inspirations really paralyzed me because I pay so much respect to other creators. I literally like, you know, I dive deep into understanding a person's form of mark making, whatever the medium is. And I, I couldn't match. I'm not as inventive as people think. I feel like I, or I feel like, I feel like I suffer a lot to, to build my ideas. And so, and I, and I never feel like, yeah, it does overwhelm me. And, but the way that I do it, um, I usually have to, submit to this one strategy when the deadline's getting closer and I'm like I've learned over time that like there you know like Jasper John says there's no such thing as a bad idea it's just about execution and so like my method of creating and not being paralyzed by my influences or the greatnesses that come before me or the greatness that is my peers is that I I say I I commit to executing a stupid idea I say <laughs> I, 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 um, yeah, that makes sense. I start with <laughs> my, does. and I, and I massage yeah. that stupid idea until yeah. it becomes poetic and poignant because I, I, I choose something simple, like really a literal, literally direct, something ugly, something corny, something like sophomoric and juvenile and, and from my heart. And, and I wrestle with it until it becomes amazing. Um, mm. because ultimately the thing that you're just missing usually is your inner, your inner truth. You Absolutely. Know? Um, I actually have a follow-up question. Um, have you ever shared your work with your mom? If so, what did, does she think of how you've built on her work? Oh, uh, well, because my family's from South Carolina and they see art as painting and sculpture and it's conservative viewpoint, but she was really humbled the fact that I was paying homage to her. Um, she didn't understand that, you know, it was an earlier form of the work, but she died in 2016. And I, you know, I, I showed her things in 2014 and 2013 and 2012. And I let her hear two tracks off the album. What she was actually, what was funny about her hearing the album part is that when I was a kid, she would curse my dad and I out like, we would like stop singing them songs in the living room, girl. And like, I was embarrassed about it because my friends would come over to play video games. And she's like, I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm, not. I'm like, oh my God, this is crazy. And she's like, y'all gonna see, um, you gonna be my backup dancer. And she was like, I'm gonna be rich. And, and this is this gonna be a number one hit. She was just really assertive about this is important material that she's making, which actually is true because it's Smithsonian collected the album. They bought the <laughs> they bought the album. Uh they bought in with the video Birds in Paradise, and it's the first vinyl in the Hershorn collection. So um, but like when she when I played the two tracks before she died, this is like 15 years later, she was like, what? You know how like your delusion of grandeur when you, 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 it's almost like you, you're preaching that this is going to be big and when it actually happens, it shows that, oh, you didn't believe it yourself. I made this into a real record. Because I think she thought you had to go into the recording studio in LA and get like $15,000 rental fee. And like now prosumer technology you can buy these machines. So we made this thing in a studio and, and, and she was like, that's me. It was really funny and it was really sweet. 
Um, and it was really wonderful uh, for a full circle closing moment before she died. Yeah, yeah. yeah. sure. Oh, that's amazing. Um, I have a question for you, Beth Ann, from Timothy. Um, Beth Ann, you suggested that muses are less common in art and fashion than they were in the past. Do you think this is symbolic of a period shift from a focus on the individual and the complexity of a person to broader ideas like the complexity of social systems and structures and how they affect us all? Okay, so let me say it's true. The only reason why it's changed is because the industry shifted because then it became the model was no longer being hired by the fashion designer. The model was being hired by an outside source, which was the casting director and the stylist. They were the interrupter, mm. disruptor between the fashion designer and the model. That relationship is needed. They get off on each other. You know, that's one thing I loved about Yves Saint Laurent. He never gave up his relationship with his, his, his muses. But in this life now, we don't have that. You know, you don't see it too often. And so I think it, it, what's gonna happen is, it, will it ever come back again? And you know, at one point I have to say, I thought that Carly Kloss was a muse. I mean, she was as close to this, that time frame because she basically was being used by a lot of different designers. They really did, they allowed her to, you know, she didn't walk like everybody else. She switched her hip because she was a dancer. She really was someone who I thought, hmm, this is like back in the day. But you know, truth be told, yeah, it did. It, 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 I don't think it'll sustain. I don't. I don't know if it'll ever come back. But someone needs to just sort of like grab hold of it and make it happen. Hmm. Um, I think we have time for one more question. Um, let's see. Mm, what do you think about that? And they are happy. Um, okay, this is uh, from Carmela. What do you think about people having a style of the art and how people sometimes copy styles self-consciously? Style of the art? I think this, let me see. Let me see if I can kind of slightly decode this. Um, what do you think about people having a style of art? Um, and how people sometimes copy styles, I think, unconsciously. Well, yeah, because that becomes like what we call trends. You know? <laughs> <laughs> that's exactly right. That's what they do. They unconsciously become part of the masses, and, then, and everybody's doing it. It's, that's a trend. Uh, truth be told, no. Um, yeah, that's interesting, that, that question, because you don't, you, you you really are at that place where you, yeah. Um, you know, I lost the first part of that question, but I was really stuck on the fact that, you know, um, muses, well, I don't know, what was the question? <laughs> oh, it was about, um, what do you think about people having a style of their art and oh, yes, then how yes. sometimes people copy yeah. styles? Yeah, yeah, that's what it, it, it becomes like a trend. And I think that's what happens. And it, it, they, it, they just get caught up in it. The style of the art is a very interesting question because I don't understand exactly that so much. But truth of it be, if it's like about a designer or someone who actually creates a, a, an idea that people get into and they like and they start to wear, okay, that's one thing. But the idea really basically when they start wearing it and they're unconscious of it is because they're picking up on, you know, everybody wants to have a supreme something. Everybody wants to have, you know, they all want to have it. And so that's mm -hmm. what it becomes. It's not individual. Yeah. Yeah, it makes me think of two things. Um, one, um, a Miles Davis quote where he says, it takes a long time to sound like yourself. Mm. And I think that that is, you know, when style comes in and your like unique style or, and or sound. Um, and then secondly, um, thinking about um, what you said about Jacoby and myself, like how much input it takes to create a certain kind of output. And so in a way, what we deem as, you know, individuality and or uh, a personal style is really our unique interpretation and or our unique uh, answer to the conversation that we're constantly having with the world, you know? Um, and so I think st style is something that, you know, evolves 
over time. Hopefully, you know, if you're being honest, and I think, you know, Jacoby, you can speak to it as well. You can kind of always tell when people are not being honest. I mean, oh, yeah. With, 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 oh, it, yeah. It always yeah. comes out. It mm-hmm. always comes out. Well, well, create- you know, but, that, but that's their limitation. That's that's all they can do. I mean, they're doing the best they can. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they're not trying to be unique. Everybody doesn't have style. Everybody, people have a style. And you can look at it and go, huh. Oh. But in the end of the day, it's the truth. So it, it, it comes down to maybe having the opportunity to be something but it really it changes as as we go along, and it's very true what you said. It 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 it, it just shifts, and that and our industry can help make things shift. And it and who drives it? Who drives that? Yeah, yeah, and I think it comes down to um, you know at its core courage, which you know Maya Angelou speaks about as being the greatest of all the virtues, because without courage you cannot practice any of the other ones consistently, and you know, it's those who have the courage to actually be themselves, the courage to actually put yourself in, you know, spaces of, 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 of unknown outcome, like yourself, Jacoby, um, where there is just this will, like, you know, Nietzsche calls it like the will to power, right? Which, which really is the will to self-actualization, not some kind of like Machiavellian kind of thing, but this, this, this impulse and Beth Ann, it's something that you've walked through the world with as well, you know, to, to move from one industry to another, from one position to another, and really in all in pursuit of yourself. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. You know, you you follow who you are, you follow who you are, you, you stay close to who you are and uh, everyone doesn't always have a roadmap. You know, they don't. And it's all right. You don't need to. Don't try to get caught up worrying about, oh, I want to be like that one. No, don't. Just be you. Amazing. Uh, Well, I think that that is a beautiful place to end. Um, I want to thank you, Beth Ann, for spending this time with us um, as you you recover from your booster shot. Um, And Jacoby, this was a beautiful conversation um, as well. I'm so grateful that you could join us here this afternoon. Um, and also lastly, thank you to the Cooper Hewitt uh, for hosting us all for this conversation in celebration of the Willie Smith exhibition and you know the art of collaboration, right? I hope that what we said today you know, is a collaboration with you and your desires you audience out there that I cannot see, um, that it hopefully inspires you to to dream um, and to be curious about this very interesting and quite rich world that we find ourselves in. Um, It's full of the strangest things. um, And, you know, stay conscious, stay curious, keep dreaming. Um, and I think that's it. I don't know, Darnell, do you want to take over from here? Um, I don't think I can end this. <laughs> no, that's absolutely perfect. <laughs> that was a great button. And we just ask that everyone stay tuned for the survey that will pop up as we close this webinar. And thank you so much to all of our guests. We really appreciate you illuminating uh, this important aspect of Willie Smith's work and how you all are living, uh, how it's living through all of you today in the contemporary world. So we appreciate this. Thank y'all so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.